Yo guys, Tanmay here for Simple Snippets, back with another video tutorial on Boolean Algebra, Logic Gates and Digital Electronics as a whole. So in this video tutorial, we'll be covering the topic of Clocked D flip-flop. Now in the previous couple of video tutorials, we've already gone through the topic of flip-flops. We know what is sequential circuits and we've also seen the working of clocks. So if you have missed those videos, you can check it out in this playlist. So coming back to this topic, we'll start off with the basic circuit diagram. We'll understand how Clocked D flip-flop is different from the Clocked SR flip-flop and then we'll go through each of its cases and we'll construct the truth table. So let's start off with the circuit diagram. Now as you can see on the screen, there are 4 NAND gates constructed in a clock D flip-flop kind of arrangement. The first 2 NAND gates that is the NAND gates in the orange are basically used with the clock. So you can see a clock green input as well over here and in D flip-flop we only have one input and it is not like SR flip-flop wherein S and R were two separate inputs. We only have one D input. So the upper NAND gate is supplied with D. However you can see for the lower NAND gate we have a NOR gate over here through which the D input passes. So you can see over here and then when it goes through the NOT gate, you know NOT gate inverts the, inverts the input. So if D is passing, you will get D bar over here. So this input is going to be D bar. Okay. So it's always going to be opposite to what D is. So this is the only difference between the clocked D flip-flop and clocked SR flip-flop. Otherwise, if you see for this part, that is the SR latch part, which is a simple SR latch, the two NAND gates are arranged in the same arrangement, which was there for the SR flip-flop as well. You can see the output of the upper NAND gate is being fed back as the input, one of the input for the lower NAND gate and output of the lower NAND gate is fed back as input as one of the input for the upper NAND gate. And then both the NAND gates are getting one one input from their corresponding previous NAND gates which are these NAND gates in orange. So the, the reason why we are using these two NAND gates is so that we can synchronize it with the clock and then control the input and output. So using clock we can turn off the entire circuit if we want and when the clock is low what we will do is when the clock is low we will make the input in such a way that the output is always going to be the previous state which means that it is going to stay in a latched state. So that's how we can use the clock to control the output. The only thing different as I mentioned in the clock D flip-flop and SR flip-flop is that in clock D flip-flop we only have one input which goes directly to the upper NAND gate and then that same input is inverted and it goes to the lower NAND gate. So what is different between the D flip-flop and what are the advantages of D flip-flop over the SR flip-flop? So you can see over here I've written in one line the main advantage. So the main advantage of D flip-flop over SR flip-flop is that D flip-flop does not have race condition as it never allows both inputs to be same. So this was a problem in SR flip-flop as well, right? So in D flip-flop you can see we have only one input. So if the upper NAND gate gets zero, you can see that zero will be complemented over here and the lower NAND gate will always get one. If the upper NAND gate gets one, the lower NAND gate will get zero. So by this, what we are doing is we are supplying different inputs always to the first NAND gates and then similarly corresponding the output of those NAND gates will always be different. So this eliminates that race condition because in SR flip-flop, remember when the output of these first two NAND gates was 0, 0, it was creating a race condition because if this is 0, the output Q bar has to be 1 because according to the truth table of NAND gate, when any of the input is 0. So you can see first three conditions where one of the input or both the inputs are 0, the output is always going to be 1. So if this is considered as 0, the Q bar has to be 1. Now again, the upper NAND gate is also having 1, 0 as an input. So again, Q also has to be 1. So this is contradictory. Right, so this is that race condition we are talking about, and this is something that we have to always avoid. And this only occurs when both upper NAND gate and lower NAND gate gets zero as an input to one of its line. So to avoid that, we are using D flip flop, and then D flip flop helps us in providing opposite inputs to upper and lower NAND gate. So the zero zero output will never come from these NAND gates. Okay, so let's understand this in more detail now because we'll go through the individual steps and we'll construct the truth table. So let's start off with case number one. Let me just write down case one. And in case one, what we're going to do is we're going to say clock equals to zero and D will be zero. Okay. So let me just write it down in the truth table also. We are saying clock equals to zero. So now when the clock equals to zero, both upper and lower NAND gate will get zero. So irrespective of what D is, when either of the input of a NAND gate is zero, the output is always going to be one, right? So the output here is always going to be one. And for lower NAND gate also, it is going to be one. So even if D is zero, or if D is 1, it doesn't matter because when clock is 0, that is when one of the input of the NAND gate is 0, 
the output is always going to be one, correct? Now when one and one is fed to the further two NAND gates as input, so so this is going to be fed back over here as inputs to the next two NAND gates. And remember when one and one is given to both the NAND gates, we have to assume one of the output or we have to take the previous output, which means that this entire system is going to work in a latch state. So let's say Q was one. So this Q will be fed back to the lower NAND gate as one. Now one and one in the truth table, you can see will give you zero. So Q bar will be zero. Now this zero will be fed back to the upper NAND gate again. So one dot zero will give you zero complement, which is again going to be one. So we're getting the previous output back, right? So this means that it is working in a latch state. So this is the latched state or also known as previous state. So in the output, we are getting Q n minus one and Q bar n minus one because we are interested in the next state, which is Q n. So we are getting the previous state. So that's why I'm writing Q n minus one or Q bar n minus one. And this input D is anything because it is a don't care condition regardless of being zero or one. The output is always going to be latch state or previous state because the clock itself is zero. So we are controlling the entire circuit using clock and we are keeping it low to keep it in latch state. Okay, so let's move on to case number two. Let me just write it down over here. Case number two, we are going to say clock equals to one. And now what we'll do is we'll say D equals to zero. So D is zero and clock is one. Let's see what happens in this case. So we've assumed D is equal to zero. So the upper NAND gate will get zero and this zero will be going over here through the NOT gate and it will be turned into a one, which will go to the lower NAND gate. So the lower NAND gate gets one. Okay. So let's come back to the upper NAND gate since one of the input is zero and we've kept the clock as one. Okay. So let me just write down one coming back to the upper NAND gate. You can see zero and one. So go to the truth table. You can see zero and one will give you output as one. So upper NAND gate value will be one for the lower NAND gate. You can see one and one will give you the output of zero. So the output of this NAND gate is going to be zero. Okay. Now take the case of lower NAND gate for this two NAND gates. That is the SR part. So when one of the input of a NAND gate is zero, the output is always going to be one. So Q bar is going to be one, right? This Q bar is going to be supplied as a feedback to the upper NAND gate, which is one. So one and one, the output Q will be zero. So here you are getting Q equals to zero and Q bar equals to one. And this is going to be termed as a reset state. And the reason why we call it a reset state is because we've considered D as zero. Okay. And we have only one input variable. So we're going to only have three cases. The first one is when clock is zero and then the D is don't care. And when the clock is one, we only have two different variations of one input, right? So when we have one input, we can have two raised to one combinations. That is zero comma one. That is two combinations. So We've already considered first one that is when D is zero. Now let's move on to case number two or case number three. Sorry. So case number three is clock equals to one again, keeping the clock as one, but now D is equal to one. So let's see what this gives us. So we are saying D equals to one over here. Okay. So we've considered D equals to one. So one goes over here. Now this one goes through the not gate and becomes zero. So zero is supplied to the lower NAND gate. So let's calculate the output for the upper NAND gate. One and one will give you zero and one and zero will give you one. So for upper NAND gate, one of the input is zero. So the output has to be high. So Q equals to one. This one is fed back to the lower NAND gate. So one and one, you can see the output is going to be zero. So Q equals to one and Q bar equals to zero. So here we got Q equals to one and Q bar equals to zero. So I'm not writing it down over here. You can see we've already filled out the truth table and this is going to be the set state. The reason why it's called set state is because we are considering D equals to one. Okay, so these were the three different cases. And if you're wondering why there are no five different cases, it is because in SR flip-flop, we had two inputs that is S and R individually. In D flip-flop, we are having two inputs, but one of the input is basically the complement of other. So it is never going to happen that D and D complement are going to be same, right? So if D is zero, D complement is going to be one. And if D is one, D complement is going to be zero, which means that there are only going to be two different cases. And the third case is when the clock is zero. And when the clock is zero, whatever be D, the output is always going to be in the latch state. That is the previous state. So here notice that we've eliminated the race condition. You can see there is no entry for that race condition scenario. So that is the main advantage I was talking of, of the D flip flop over the SR flip flop that there is never going to be a condition which results into an unstable output. Lastly, just see the block diagram. You can see only one thing has changed. That is, there is only one input D. There is no SNR over here. There's only one input D. The clock is as it is and the output Q and Q bar is as it is because the front end or the front side is the basic SR flip flop only. Only the back side, which is combined with the clock is changed for the D flip flop. 
So yeah, that's it for this video, guys. I hope you understood the working of clock D flip flop and how it is different and more advantageous over the regular SR flip flop. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and if you haven't yet subscribed to this channel, make sure you subscribe to this channel so that you get notified whenever I upload a new video tutorial. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.